to you, uh, one of our hosts, Susan Barger from DSAIC. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the uh, coordinator for Connecting to Collections Care, and we are really pleased to be offering this webinar with um, the Canadian Conservation Institute. So um, I'm going to go through a few slides. If you need to reset your course path, a uh, course password, you can contact info at culturalheritage.org. If you have other questions, you can contact me at c2cc at culturalheritage.org, uh, um, and we'll take care of them. If you need to find out what the time for the webinars, use a time zone converter. And here's one. There are a lot of them. And when you're looking at the uh, the, the uh, platform, and you've signed in, you can find the handouts and the discussions. It will give you the time that a uh, webinar starts. And the webinars are always on Eastern time. That's New York time. And uh, it also will say, like here on the left, this event should start at blah, blah. Um, then once the webinar has been posted, if you look on the right-hand side, it will say View on Demand Recording. And you can listen to the webinar there. You need to listen to the webinars. It doesn't matter if you listen to them as recordings or live. I see we have people that are up at 5 o'clock in Australia good for you, but you don't have to torture yourself. So as long as you listen to the webinar, you're fine. Um, the best way to keep in touch about um, connecting to Collections Care is to join our announced list. This is the address to do that. Um, or you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. And uh, for people in the US, um, who might be affected by the flooding. This is the 24-hour uh, emergency hotline for conservation. So um, please feel free to avail yourselves of that. And without further ado, I'm going to send this over to uh, Simon, uh, Simon Lambert from CCI. He will be the coordinator for this course. So Simon, take it away. Thank you, Susan. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to offer this first ever uh, reorg online course, um, which is a six-part webinar uh, series. And uh, I just want to start off by thanking some of our partners, because this is a collective effort uh, to get this content uh, over to you. And um, so. First of all, the uh, Kikirpa, the Royal uh, Institute for Cultural Heritage in Belgium, ICROM, uh, the Science Museum of Minnesota, and Stash as well, um, who uh, brought this opportunity to us and um, allowed us to uh, uh, create this course for, uh, for you. So um, I, we are a lot of people from all over the world, all connected right now. We're um, 156 participants signed up from 22 countries, so it's very nice to see such a widespread of participants. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Connecting to Collections Care online community for hosting and producing the event. So thank you very much. Um, Overall, what you can expect to be able to do at the end of this six webinar series that is that you'll have developed a basic reorg plan to improve collections access and care in one of your storage rooms. So you'll be able to either um, do that, or if you follow along with us uh, webinar by webinar, you will have your plan ready by the end of this course. So um, that is an indication of the course objectives. And we are starting today with the first webinar, which is called Introduction to Reorg Fundamentals. And what we hope to be able to achieve today is uh, we'll be going through two different case studies um, showing the implementation of a reorg project in Canada and another one in Belgium uh, that will be presented by one of our partners. Um, and you will be able to, or to recognize the four phases of reorg, the four components of reorg and the 10 criteria for functional storage. 
uh, and we'll also uh, be touching upon some of the key factors in successful reorg projects. So we'll be talking about teamwork, about reusing and adapting existing equipment, and also how to engage your community. I do want to mention that the reorg method is available online on the eCrom website. The e reorg methodology was developed by eCrom uh, in partnership with UNESCO and has been adapted for distance learning thanks to a partnership with us at the Canadian Conservation Institute. Um, it is available in four languages currently, and more languages are, are coming, uh, so English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese at the moment. Um, and so a lot of the um, exercises we'll be referring to or the worksheets are all found in these resources. If you don't have time to jot down this uh, URL, if you Google ECROM and REORG, you will find this resource. Before beginning uh, this first webinar, you should all have watched the REORG tutorial video. If you have not watched the video, uh, you received an email earlier this week from Susan um, giving you the link to the video. So, so it's, it's just an overview, but we will not be covering um, the same things that are in this video, so I do encourage you to view the video first. Just to summarize what was covered in the video is that uh, reorg is basically uh, includes four components that we're looking at. So we're looking at uh, building in space, uh, we're looking at the collection, we're looking at furniture and small equipment, and management. So those are the four key components of the reorg method. Um, it includes four phases, which we'll be going through today two times, one for the uh, first case study and one for the second case study. And it includes 10 quality criteria. Now, before we go any further, I should introduce myself. My name is Simon Lambert. I'm a preservation development advisor for the Canadian Conservation Institute in Ottawa, Canada. And I am co-hosting this first webinar with my colleague, Marjolein de Boupap, uh, from Belgium, and also known as Marjo. <laughs> you can call her that. Um, and she is the head of preventive conservation at the Royal Institute uh, for Cultural Heritage in Belgium, or Kik Irpa. Now, um, for the case, first case study, I want to take you on a trip to um, Truro, Nova Scotia in Canada. Uh, and we'll be going through step-by-step um, -step through this project, uh, which will help you to understand um, in practice what do the four phases of reorg look like in practice. And I want to thank Margaret Mulroney, who's the curator administrator of the Colchester Historium in Truro, Nova Scotia, um, who um, shared her slides and her uh, space for us to uh, implement this project at her museum. So Nova Scotia is on the eastern coast of Canada, and Truro and the Col Colchester Historium is located uh, where the little place marker is. Colchester Historium um, is run by the Colchester Historical Society, which was founded in 1954. It's located in the downtown core of Truro. Uh, it includes both a museum and an archive. We have two full-time staff working there uh, and several volunteers. Uh, there's an exhibit space on the first and third floor, and the storage is on the third floor, which is where we'll be focusing our attention today and also in the basement. Um, there are archives on the second floor, and the collection comprises approximately 6,000 artifacts. So in the video, you'll recall that the first part of reorg is really is called getting started. And the idea behind this first phase is to create the best possible conditions for a successful storage reorganization. So at the Colchester Historium, where we worked uh, in 2016, um, we had a team of 15 museum professionals who were available to work for three days. So that is the kind of timeline of this project. And the context for this, um, for this project was a workshop. So of course, when you are working in your own museums, 
Um, you will probably not have, or you may have 15 professionals, uh, but you may not have 15 professionals. You may have two, three, four people working, uh, and your project will then likely be a bit longer. Uh, but this is just showing what was accomplished in those three days with 15 people. Um, in terms of the skills uh, that we had in this group, we had someone who was very, very comfortable with carpentry. So that was very useful, because as you'll see, we put those skills to use. Uh, we had um, people who were very experienced in box making, uh, in rolling textiles, uh, in various collections management related activities as well. So it was quite a skilled group. Um, we had also prepared some uh, working areas. Um, so we had a swing space and a work area. The swing space is a very critical um, requirement for any reorg project. And it's, it's usually necessary in a reorg project to empty the collection storage area, or at least part of it, uh, out of storage in order to reconfigure the layout. And so it's very important to have a space where collections can be moved into, uh, and also have an area where work can be done. And sometimes that's dirty work like carpentry and things like that. So those areas need to be um, accommodated and planned for ahead of time. Um, in terms of floor plans, we did have a floor plan. Um, and our materials and supplies that we had uh, included measuring tapes, gloves, tools, and also storage shelving, which I'll go into a bit later. So that's kind of an overview of the conditions we had going into uh, this project. As I mentioned, the storage that we'll be looking at is on the third floor of this institution. And it's kind of like in an attic space with some slanted, uh, some wonderful slanted ceilings that are very challenging to work with. So you can kind of see here inside the storage area and how the, I'm talking about these slanted ceilings. So at the far back of this image, you'll see that um, from the floor to the ceiling is, is about three feet or one meter. And then it goes up to the highest point of the room. Um, and you have this wonderful uh, sprinkler pipe that goes through the floor um, and kind of uh, goes then onto the ceiling. So it's, it's an obstacle that we obstacle had to deal with in this project. You can see here a little bit on top this sprinkler pipe going above the collection um, from the bottom. So, um, And you can see also on the back wall where the ceiling begins to slant. So we have all of this space that's basically unusable against the wall. So that's a big uh, challenge we had in this space. More images, again, from the same perspective as the source slide, showing you a little bit what is going on here. So we have a lot of collections on the floor. Um, we have just things not necessarily grouped by type or by size. Uh, we just have. Um, access issues, let's say. <laughs> We're not really able to uh, respect uh, uh, that two-object rule, which we'll be talking about. Um, so we're not able to um, retrieve objects safely without moving more than two other objects. So we have this, this issue here with accessing the collections, images, like the slanted ceiling. And this is from the other perspective. So the, the pipe would be back to us right now, looking towards the other end of the room. And you can see still the sprinkler pipes up top. These are some of the textiles. Here we see another room, which is called the props room, or the props storage. And that is where um, the intention was to store all the objects that are not accessioned but are, are being used for various purposes in display. Um, so mannequins and uh, things that are not accessioned. Um, there was uh, a lot of, there were actually a lot of collection items that were accessioned in this room. So that was one of the things that we had to deal with as part of this project. Here we have just a sneak peek into the basement storage, which we didn't work on. Well, we worked in the basement, but we didn't address this specific issue within, the, uh, within this project. But you'll see what happened after we left. 
And so this is an idea of the floor plan um, of this storage. So um, if you, this is, the blue line shows the line of the ceiling, so the slanted ceiling. So this kind of rect rectangle um, in the top right corner of that plan is the highest point of the room at 3.5 meters or 11 feet. And it kind of progressively slants down in those two directions to hit the wall at about three feet. So that's kind of how slanted the ceiling is. Um, we have uh, some collections, some non-collections on the floor, so things that were not part of the collection that are not accessioned, and some collections that are on the floor directly as well. Um, and here we have the, uh, this uh, vertical pipe coming through the floor. That's an obstacle in that area. And this is the pipe going through the room. So in terms of the 10 quality criteria for reorg, so these are kind of the basic things that one would expect out of a functional storage area that's designed to, um, for staff to be able to work with the collection, to be able to use the collection for their museum activities, uh, to meet their mandate, to engage their communities. And so these are the things that um, reorg says you should expect out of a functional storage area. So I'm going to go through them one by one and at the same time assess what we had in that, um, in that storage at the Colchester Historium. So at the time of the workshop, we did not have one qualified member of staff that was in charge, although we had someone who was uh, hosting us and who was the curator. Um, she was not formally in charge of storage, and so that was not uh, met. Um, we, have, we did not only have collection objects in storage. So we had um, a range of non-collection items, and we also had collection items which were outside of storage, as I mentioned, in that props room. Um, we did not have separate spaces dedicated to what we call support functions, so an office, a workroom, um, uh, equipment storage, and storage of uh, other materials, like packing materials and things like that. So everything was kind of a little bit everywhere. Um, we did not have, well, we did have objects placed directly on the floor, so we did not meet this criteria, this criterion either. Um, every object did not have a designated location in storage, and it could not be located within three minutes. Now, I can see, I can hear you, <laughs> you people um, kind of looking at three minutes and, and getting kind of nervous. And so three minutes is what, uh, is the time that we would, considered to be acceptable for a small collection, so 10,000 objects, one or two storage rooms. Um, if, you, if your institution is larger than that or if you have off-site locations, obviously this number would change. But this is just an indication of, um, of what you could expect for a small collection. And the, the point here is that we're putting a number on it. We're not saying uh, located quickly. We're saying in three minutes because that way, if in time, it starts to take 20 minutes to find objects, you know that something's wrong. So we're putting really measurable benchmarks to each one of these. Similarly, if you look at number six, which we did not meet either, is every object can be accessed without moving more than two other objects. And so we did not, as you saw in some of the slides, meet this either. Objects are arranged by category. This was not the case. So by category mean mostly size, type, shape, um, access requirements. So we'll go into the categories a little bit more in the second webinar. Uh, we did not have key policies and procedures, uh, and they were not applied. Um, we did, however, have a building, which is good, and storage rooms that offered adequate protection for the collection, which is a very good thing. We did have a sprinkler system, which is excellent as well. Um, Every object is free from active deterioration and is ready to be used for the museum's activities. Mostly everything was in a good condition, and mostly everything was ready to be used for exhibition purposes. But the problem is you had to find these things, and that was the big challenge. These two uh, takes us to the storage condition report, um, as you recall from the video. And the goal here is to document the state of storage and to identify 
the major issues that are affecting collections access and conservation. Um, so for the management component, we found that um, there were the roles uh, related to storage and the responsibilities related to storage were somewhat unclear. And some of the key procedures uh, for managing the collection were not formalized. Um, in terms of building and space, we found that the building offered reasonably good protection. Um, however, the space was 100% used. There was no free space for anything else to be added in there. Um, and some uh, non-collection items were found in storage. So we did have some props that were in the storage area and some collections that were in the props area. Um, there was an inefficient use of vertical space. And there was an inefficient use of floor, floor space. Pardon me. Um, and we'll be going into um, all those spatial calculations and estimations next week in webinar two. Um, access to the collection was difficult in some areas. In terms of furniture and small equipment, the units were over full, so 200% full, which means that you would have needed two times the amount of units that were currently in that room to store the collection adequately. Um, collections uh, were inaccessible. Uh, the inventory was incomplete. And there was no functional location system. You, I should say there was no reliable location system. There was a functional location system. Well, there was a location system, but it was not um, reliable. Therefore, I guess, not functional as well. For phase three, um, which is the action plan, and that's where you define your tasks and establish a timeline for your project. So for our project, um, I'm just going to bring up this floor plan again that we have for the space and remove all the nice little drawings that we have there just to get at the, the floor, floor plan with only the units, only the storage units that are there. So what our plan was to increase the usage of floor space by adding some rolling shelving units in the middle of the space uh, when it was determined that the floor could handle the load because we wouldn't necessarily be adding a lot of heavy things. We'd actually be removing some things from that area. Uh, and so we found some shelving units that we'll, we'll, we'll go into a little bit later. But the plan was to replace some of the units that were there and to install some rolling shelving, uh, to use the wall, um, the room height a little more efficiently to store the costumes and to install some wall racks for long and thin objects along one of the walls that you see on the, on the right wall. Here's a before and after of those two. And what I'm highlighting in yellow is the areas where we were going to be using the floor space a little bit more efficiently. Uh, but that doesn't really give you the full picture, because we were also going to be using the vertical space more efficiently. So if I just show you that before and after, it doesn't give a full, uh, the full impact of what we were going to be doing in that space. So just keep in mind that we're also working on the vertical space, not only the floor space usage. So this is a, just a quick sketch that we had uh, posted for all the participants to know what the objective was or what the final result would be after this workshop. Uh, the plans that I just showed you. And what I'm going to do now is to list what the different mini projects were for this larger project. The mini projects are ways of um, dividing the, um, the, the, the task at hand, which is to reorganize that storage area, into smaller tasks that are usually um, associated with um, an object type or um, what we call a category, which the categories we'll be talking about in the next webinar. But think of, it, think of them as different um, storage systems or object types. So here we have, as first mini project, we have textiles or clothing that need to be rolled. So the situation now is that they're in a pile somewhere in the storage, and they're, or they're in cardboard boxes. So what we need to do is to create a rack system for these rolled textiles. So that's one of the mini projects. And to that project, we can assign, uh, in our case, we had 15 people, so we can assign two people to work on that. 
Um, another project, a mini project, was the textiles and clothing that need to be hung. So especially the long ones here that we're talking about. So right now, they're in a, in a unit that's overcrowded, where they're not accessible. And so the idea is to create a hanging rod system. So um, a wall hung uh, rod that we can hang the textiles on. Similarly, the shorter textiles, the, the ones that are hung, are in the same situation right now. And we do need to hang those as well. But they're being considered separately because they're a different subcategory of the textiles to be hung. So these are all separate little mini projects. Uh, textiles, clothing to be boxed. So right now, they're stuffed in drawers, which are overcrowded. So what we need to do is to create boxes and to in boxes. Uh, we have some paintings that are lying on the floor. And the idea there was to create a slotted unit, so a compartmentalized shelving that you could slide the paintings into to use the space more efficiently and to avoid having the paintings directly on the floor where they could fall over or be kicked or something by, by someone. And then we had uh, these long and thin items. Um, and so the idea uh, was to create a rack system for them, because right now they're being stored on the shelves or on the floor or in piles. And so the idea with these long and thin things, think of canes or um, spears. We didn't have any spears in this collection. But that kind of long, thin item that if, if you place them on a shelf, you're not using the vertical space on that shelf efficiently. So we had to find a different way of storing them in order to get those shelves for three-dimensional objects. Here, uh, we also have uh, small to medium objects uh, that we needed to um, send them. Oh, yeah, so these are the robust items. Um, we need to send them to the basement, so the ones that won't be really affected by um, basement conditions. Uh, we, we could send them to the basement and regroup them by size. And then we had other projects that were of a different type. So we have this issue in this particular case where um, we had, like I mentioned, a museum and an archive. And at some point in time, they were using the same accession number system. And so whenever a document would come into the archives and an object would come into the museum, it could happen that they would be given the same number. And so in the database, you basically, once you, when you search for something, you could expect to find an object, and actually you were finding a document. So <laughs> we had to remove the objects that, were, that had these duplicate accession numbers. And the curator identified that this had happened between, let's say, 2015 and 2017. This problem occurred. And so while we were doing this reorg, and we would, we would be handling every, almost every object, it was a great time for us to look at every single accession number. And if we found some that were between 2015 and 2017, we would isolate them so that the museum staff could process them later, because they would need to re uh, or change the accession number, reaccession them. Another mini project was the preparation of the basement. Um, at the moment, as you saw in the first slides of where I was showing the basement, there is no space whatsoever. Everything is overcrowded down there. And so, but we did find, find some units that were located in other parts of the institution that we, we could repurpose and adapt to create um, uh, temporary storage for uh, those objects that we were removing from third floor, the, the, robust, the robust ones. And so the idea was to adapt those units and to create a temporary location system for those objects. And these units that we found held some books that were being used in a book sale that was happening every weekend. Uh, and there weren't that many um, that they, they weren't, let's, let's say, stored efficiently. And so we could, um, we could get a few of those units for the collection. Um, we also uh, needed to prepare the prop room, because at the moment it was storing both objects and non-collection objects and collection objects. And so we needed to make sure that that was very well segregated. So we had 
no collection objects in there and only non-collection. That clear division. And we also needed to prepare the compact storage units. So um, as you saw in the floor plan, we were going to be installing a whole row of units in the middle of the space. So all of those needed to be assembled and to prepare, uh, to be prepared to accommodate the collection. These are the main mini projects that happen throughout this, uh, this uh, experience at the Colchester Historium. And what we did is we had this Gantt chart that we created, which basically split um, each different color that you see there is a different team working on one or more different mini projects. So maybe we grouped all the textiles together, and that was a group. And within that group, then they divided who was going to be dealing with the textiles that are rolled, and who would be dealing with the textiles that are hung, and who would be dealing with the textiles that are boxed. And so over the three days, then we could see how the tasks uh, were divided. And as people would complete the tasks, they were invited to use the red pen that you see hanging there and color in the boxes so that every group could see what others were doing and where they were in terms of the progress of their tasks. And we'll be showing you, as part of this webinar series, how to create one of these charts as well. So the implementation is then once you've developed your action plan, which we've gone through with these uh, the, the, the chart and also with the mini projects, then the implementation is actually the practical work, which our workshop focused on. So you can see here participants assembling the storage units together. That's me, in case you've never seen what I look like. <laughs> I was preparing the units in the basement for storage end up with the most glamorous tasks, of course. Um, create the boxes for textiles. So here we have a group making learning how to make boxes uh, and making boxes. Um, we have um, um, a few of us then relocating the more robust objects to the basement in a temporary storage location. This is a swing space that we used, um, which was a kind of a training room, conference room, uh, programming room that was right next to the storage area, which was empty. And so this was great because, and really was key in the success of this project, because we were able to um, set up some, ter some temporary shelving in there uh, to accommodate all the objects coming out of storage. Because you have to think that when objects are in shelving units in storage and you want to empty that room, you also have to provide shelving units in your swing space. Otherwise, you know, if you're using the floor or tables, those will fill up very fast. And so we were able to actually use some of the rolling shelving units that we were going to be putting back into storage to temporarily house those objects. And as those were being emptied, then they could be installed in the room to accommodate the objects. So this is us uh, as we were emptying the central, that central section of the storage where we were going to be installing the rolling shelving. So we're starting to take the objects out and remove the storage units. And this is a little bit more as well from the other perspective, where we're also emptying some of the textiles that were hung in those um, plywood units. This is a room that we had to temporarily isolate all those problem objects that we found. Um, and so these are the objects that had double accession numbers. So we were able to segregate those from the others as part of this uh, process. So this is where we put them. As you can see, now it's continuing. We're emptying the central section even more. We've removed all of those plywood units that had the textiles in them. And we're not removing everything from this room. It would be false to say that we emptied the whole thing. But we removed everything that would be in the way of us reconfiguring the layout. And whatever could stay in there, um, such as this textile unit and some of the units uh, on the perimeter of the room, which weren't going to be really changing, we left in there just to minimize un unnecessary handling. And here we're rehousing costumes that were found uh, in drawers, uh, reusing the pegboard to optimize space. 
And this is the pegboard that was actually the back of the units, um, the textile units that were made of plywood. The backing of them was, was pegboard. So we were able to repurpose that pegboard to hang some of the long, thin items. We're using vertical space more efficiently by creating a double tier hanging system for garments. And we're also creating a makeshift hanging system for rolled textiles using recycled materials from those same textile units. As we dismantled them, we reused the wood, and we found some chain in the basement, and so we were creating a hanging system. And this is all to, for us to be able to use that planted ceiling, which was a lot of space that we needed to be able to use. And so we created this, this hanging system for textiles. Um, around the room, around the perimeter of the room, as I mentioned, we didn't remove everything. But uh, we did rearrange objects by type and by size in order to uh, improve space efficiency. So that's what we're doing here around the room. See, this is the chart being colored by the groups as they progress through the, the tasks. I'm just going to show you some before. This is the, the view before. Um, before the reorg, and this is after, once we've installed the shelving. Located at the center of this room are the textiles, the box textiles. The other perspective, before, after. Before and after with those pegboard units. Uh, installed on the slanted ceiling. Um, what uh, this is the self-evaluation, the reorg self-evaluation, which um, you will all be completing for your own uh, institution or for an institution you work with uh, as an assignment at the end of this webinar. Um, so this is the uh, before situation. There's been a little bit of improvement in the management area. Improvement in building and space, collection, furniture, and small equipment. So this is after three days. And of course, the reorg isn't the final. Uh, you can't expect to finish everything within those three days or within your reorg project. There's always going to be work, detailed work, that can happen afterwards, like object rehousing or the inventory also needs to happen, but that can happen after. So the real goal of this kind of first initial physical reorganization, as we call it, is to regain access and to regain control of the collection so that you can go into those more detailed projects afterwards. So this is the, um, these are the 10 quality criteria before the reorg workshop, and this is after. So we still do not have a designated location uh, in storage, and the objects cannot be found within three minutes because that, for that to happen, we needed really to go through the inventory uh, and do that, and that was done by the staff afterwards. Uh, and we still did not have the key policies and procedures, uh, but the staff did work on that afterwards, and those were done as well. So just some data for the project here. So those 15 people working for three days, that's 338 person hours. Um, the budget was 5,000 Canadian, 3,800 US, 3,300 Euro. Um, apologies if I don't have your currency, um, but um, the idea is it's a small, it's a relatively small amount, uh, and most of that went towards the storage units that we had to purchase the rolling shelving for the center of the room. We were able to reuse and repurpose plywood from the existing shelving uh, and pegboard from the existing shelving. Uh, and the materials that we purchased included corrugated plastic for boxes and uh, also for some pre-assembled boxes that we used and, uh, and also, as I mentioned, the sliding shelving units. And the modular sliding shelving unit system we used, I'm not going to give any brand names, but it's readily available um, uh, and it, it fits. It's these tracks that have these wheels on them. Um, that fit directly onto these tracks that you lay them down directly on the floor like train tracks and they snap into each other and uh, you don't need to screw them onto the floor. So you do need a level floor to use these. And you can't store things that are very heavy on these shelves. They do have a limited um, load capacity and so you want to check that whatever 
you will be storing on these uh, will not make the shelves bend um, because we did discover that in one workshop uh, <laughs> that uh, extremely heavy objects that were even there temporarily did make those shelves bend. So you have to make sure that um, what you're storing on there won't be too heavy. Um, we did uh, publish a few articles on this project in Stash. So those of you who aren't familiar with Stash, it's this collection of storage solutions um, that was piloted, uh, that was spearheaded by Lisa Goldberg and Rachel Ehrenstein, who are co-coordinators of this workshop. Um, uh, and uh, we have a couple of articles of the different storage solutions that we used in this project up on Stash. So what happened after the reorg, after we finished the project? And this is a very important point because it, it highlights the benefits of doing a reorg project. So a few uh, weeks or months, I can't remember, after the reorg project, um, there was a water, a water main burst right next to the museum. Now in the second image, uh, you can see in the upper right corner of the second image, uh, you can, that's the museum there, that brick building. So re really close to the, uh, to the actual museum. And then water came into the basement. Yes, thank you for the arrow. <laughs> uh, and uh, water came into the basement. Now, uh, because we had gone through the basement as part of the reorg uh, project to make room for those objects that were coming out of storage temporarily, we had removed everything from the floor. And this saved uh, a lot of objects that were then not in contact with water uh, as a result of that flood. So the benefit of doing the reorg here is uh, improving your emergency uh, response and uh, preventing damage through things like floods. Uh, and so it's not just about just uh, tidying up or sorting things like uh, creating order like you would in your um, in your in your basement or in your garage. Uh, there are more uh, far-reaching uh, benefits to these kinds of projects. Here is another example of before. Okay, so this is after the reorg still. And the team uh, at the museum continued to work on their basement uh, after we left. And uh, this is uh, how it looked like before, and this is after. So we can see that the team that was trained as part of this workshop that worked at that institution was so energized by this process that they continued to work on their basement because they knew that that was the next area that they could now tackle since their third level storage was reorganized. So since then, they've been able to complete their inventory. Uh, they mentioned that 90% of their objects have been photographed. Uh, everything was uploaded to the online collections database, which you see a screenshot of here in the lower left corner. Um, and um, they're now able to feature uh, those objects for their community on social media. So every couple of weeks, they have objects from their collection uh, that are beautifully photographed and that they can engage with people um, from their community, which was not possible before the reorg. Um, because this is kind of what their image documentation looked like before. Uh, they were able to do their inventory uh, and do their photography project. And this is how their image looks now. So as a result of the reorg, they were really able to get a handle on their collection and to do detailed work like photographing their whole collection. That's it for me. So I would like to pass now uh, the uh, presentation over to Marjo from Belgium. OK, thanks, Simon. Hello, everybody. I'm Marjolaine, and I'm talking to you from Brussels, the capital of the European Union. I'm going to show you a two-week reorganization project in one of the storage areas of our National Museum of Art and History. In October 2015, we reorganized the folk art storage of that museum. As you see on the map, Belgium is a very tiny country with almost the same surface area as Maryland, but 10 times more inhabitants per square mile. Here you see a map of Europe, with Belgium almost in the middle. And Brussels is one hour driving from the North Sea coast and is squeezed between, I'm going to try to find the arrow, France, the Netherlands, and Germany. 
Besides being a tiny country, we also have a complex governmental structure with three communities and three regions, which implicates that we have three official languages. The Art and History Museum lies in the middle of a park. Right here, in the middle of the park, in the center of Brussels. The folk art storage lies on the first floor of the building here in yellow, and has a very particular half-circle half shape, as you see here on the Google view from above. It's, an, it's a very uneven storage, and we reorganize mainly the light blue part of around 3,000 square feet. Complicated with the arrow, yes. You see the light blue part. The yellow part was added during the reorganization project to receive very big objects. And here I show you like a long corridor with sections divided by walls. Here you see walls. And if there are when there are no walls, there were furniture. There was furniture. As you will see later on. The main entrance is here. Here you see kind of improvised here you see the kind of improvised entrance door to the storage with a collection in cabinets who serve sometimes as walls to divide the storage into smaller sections. Cabinets with objects above the cabinets. Here. Electrical wiring. A glance towards the end of the corridor, of the long corridor open shelves and non-collection on the floor, a view again of the corridor or a view on the corridor and on the corridor and on your left you see theater puppets hanging on bars covered with white cotton bags to protect them from light and dust. It's a bit a sinister view but um, anyway. This is a glance into the small yellow room at the back of the storage. And I want to go into detail into the collection, but all the cabinets were filled with collection. Like you see here, a doll house, an open display or a doll house which was covered, a covered boat, theater uh, panels which were sold on pallets, uh, a piece of a wooden horse. I give you a glance of all the cabinets which were filled with collection and different uh, kind of collection like books, ceramics, toys, metal pots and textiles, walking sticks, small puppets hanging in cabinets, big puppets, the ones who are covered. The horse, painted theater decor on pallets, and open wooden shelves with no location system. So the location system is inadequate. In some uh, cases, the cupboards were uh, had a location system, but it was really uh, not complete. Anyway, in the collection, you find big objects like this dollhouse, a specific thing in this in this uh, reorganization project was that you see the smallest objects of the collection are the tea sets to put into the dollhouses. Here is one of the dollhouses covered, but so these very tiny objects were connected or were so tiny and we had to cope with these kind of objects and the big objects like the dollhouses. So, we had to cope with very different sizes, besides the fact that we were going to have to reorganize almost 12,000 objects in 120 pieces of furniture. Before launching this workshop, eight Belgian colleagues got trained into the reorg method by Gaël de Guichin from ICROM, and you see him here in white. And you see us 
working here in the folk art storage preparing the upcoming workshop. We were becoming a solid teaching team because after the training of trainers, I launched a call for participation in Belgium to the two-week REOC workshop, which was finally held in October 2015. Sixteen museum professionals were chosen to join the workshop. And on the right, you see Linda Wullis, who is the curator uh, of the storage. She is giving the visit, the first visit to the storage. And here you see her showing the collection to the participants, while uh, we also created a classroom for the few theoretical courses. And like proposed in the method, you definitely have to foresee a common area to have coffee breaks, and also a place to install tools and working material for workshop. Now, the self-evaluation form shows that for three of the four components, so one, two, three, the four components Simon, Simon uh, talked about already, um, a reorganization project is needed. So due to the fact that the storage is already filled up with 120 pieces of furniture, this last component on furniture and small equipment uh, only needed small improvements. Compared to Simon's Canadian Museum, we can add uh, one more fulfilled criterion, because this storage, the folk art storage, had at least one qualified member in charge, which is Linda. Let me show you details of the two-week workshop. We got started with a group of 26 Belgian museum professionals. And 16 of them are working in eight different museums. And each museum allowed two colleagues to join the workshop. Because all eight museums had a storage to be reorganized after the workshop by their respective collaborators. You remember also the eight trainers or the mentors. Um, and um, I am here in front uh, of the stairs. My uh, light jacket, so you know how I look like. And here you see us all together at the beginning of the workshop, being a group which had to become a team. And working in team has to be learned and truly takes a lot of time. A good team consists of eight characteristics. First of all, you need a common objective. For the workshop in Brussels, this was to reorganize the folk art storage according to the plan which had to be accepted by the curator, according to the rules of the museum, according to the reorg method, by regrouping the collections in the blue and the yellow room, in team, with no object damaged and no personal injuries. The whole reorganization project had to be completed within two weeks by noon. The second characteristic is about language. And uh, it's not about the fact that in Belgium we speak different, uh, three different languages, because I, I, I solved this problem by using uh, English as the teaching, la teaching language. But the characteristics of using a common language within a team means that you agree on all using the same words, for example, for cupboards or cabinets or shelf units. And you have to be sure that everybody understands each other when using these terms. And here you see us in the classroom, and Gaël de Guichin is teaching the whole group uh, what to understand by collection and non-collection. You will hear us talking about collection and non-collection. Simon did it already in his uh, presentation. But this has to be explained. And uh, the green, you see the green cards people have in their hands, and the red cards show you visually during a teaching course if everybody understands the same or agrees when discussing a certain topic. The third point is the common management of time. It's a key factor to get the team and the work on track, not only during a workshop, but also if you would start your reorg project by your own. During the two weeks in, uh, in the folk art storage, one participant was responsible to keep up with time. And it doesn't mean strict time management, but it means that you check 
if all the work has been done in time and you verify if uh, someone needs more or less time and uh, you try to adapt. The common uh, management of time, I show you one slide again. And the common method we used was, of course, the real method. The fifth characteristic is my hobby horse. It's, uh, it's not only because it's about making fun and having pleasure, because, but it's because I truly believe strongly in the power of this characteristic within team building. Not only having pleasure doing work, but also when you organize lunches and dinners or parties in the evening. Within a good team, each one has a clear task. And during the workshop, we divided the storage into four different sectors. You see here the plan of the storage, which I showed you before. Um, we divided the storage into four sectors, one, two, three, four. And we divided the group into four teams. And all groups were going to study four different sectors. Each team had a color, and you see each team working in his sector. Besides the clear task you need, there is the respect for each other's work. And here you see uh, the technical team of the museum helping us to move one of the heavy dollhouses. The technical team nor the cleaning team were efficient participants of the workshop, but you will see them on most of the group pictures because without them, our REOC project would uh, not have succeeded in time. You need a recognized leader during a reorg project. And perhaps it's a bit weird for you to imagine us recognizing this uh, crazy white guy, which is Yael Ligichin, as our leader during the workshop. But um, remember having good times as a characteristic. I show you a picture of, of him explaining some stuff to, to the teaching team, because he's the leader. But I show this slide to uh, show also that Linda is standing there, the curator. And she is the one who had to take the final decisions because she's the responsible of the storage, of course. She was also the one who checked our daily working plans. And here you see on the uh, everyday working plan, you see the objective of the day with a checklist of tasks and the time uh, it had to be done. Each of the four teams made these kind of working plans every morning, and Linda could follow what was going to happen that day in her storage. She was full time with us during those two weeks. Being a group at the very beginning, and uh, yeah, you see that you become a team. After two days of team building, this results in a fantastic team. And you need this team because this team starts now working on the storage condition report, which is the second phase of the workshop. As I mentioned before, the overall team was divided into four teams of six. And each team studied different sectors. The numbers you see here are from one, one to nine. I added some others, but the workshop was mainly um, working with the nine sectors. Uh, you see them on the plan of the storage. And um, we really worked on the sectors one to now, nine. For example, the yellow team works on the sector uh, or the space uh, one and two. And they were analyzing the furniture and non-collection items. And the other teams were also working on other spaces or other sectors uh, and analyzing the furniture and the collection. Here you see the measuring furniture, measuring height. One of the participants is counting items of the collection in open shelves. So she's analyzing, analyzing the collection uh, within her sector. And um, we all le needed Linda. Here you see Linda to help us count and identify the collections in the cabinets. Um, as the inventory was not complete, we decided to count all the objects in the collection, which means around 12,000 objects or items. Um, she had to help us because she knows what is in the cupboards, how many are in the cupboards. And some objects you see, many objects were covered in silk paper or were wrapped. Each team drew the plan. You see here the first plan, plan 
one of the methods. And um, then you have the plan two with the fixture. I go into detail. You have fixtures like electrical wiring and water pipes. And here in this second sector of the storage, you have uh, an electrical talent device at the bottom, uh, which is one of the servers of the museum. Um, I'll explain it later why it is important. Here you see an overview of uh, plan number three of the storage with furniture. So you see drawings of the furniture on the sectors and on the overall plan. This is the detail of the blue team working in sector six and seven. And during this storage condition report phase, one of the most important and exciting steps to undertake is to walk through the collection and put sticky notes to identify what is collection and non-collection. And as the curator could not always be around each team, we also provided blue notes to stick on those objects uh, which we were not sure of if it's collection or non-collection. So you see here the results. On top of the, um, of the cabinets, you find non-collection with the red sticky notes. And the items in the cabinets and in the small drawers will remain collection. The results of this exercise need to be transferred on plan four, um, which is showing the floor occupation in the storage with the collection in green, see here the collection in green, and non-collection in red. So each team draw this plan for each sector. And at the end, we assemble all sectors into one plan. You see the blue team working on their plan in the corresponding sector. So after two days and a half, we had a detailed condition report of the management, the building, the furniture, and the small equipment, and the collection. And this worksheet six of the REOC method gives you an overview of the composition of the total of all collection items. So in yellow here above, you see sector one, two, three, four, five, until nine. And here on the left, each each type of collection in the overall storage, like basketry, books, dolls, uh, iron objects, textile, and costumes. And I'm trying to find very visual. When you see the textile and costume collection, you see you have 291 items in sector 1, 225 in sector 2, and for instance, one in sector 5. Um, this detailed information is then used to regroup the collection items, uh, which are dispersed all over the storage. But Simon is going to explain you this next week in the second webinar. With 56 metal cabinets, 13 uh, metal drawers, 17 shelvings, and 11 wooden cabinets, we counted 30% floor occupation, which means that the storage has enough space to receive additional furniture and has the potential to gain additional space. But these calculations will also be explained in the next webinar. After identifying the mostly no existence of uh, small equipment in the storage, we were ready for phase three, which is drawing the storage action, action plan. And so we were going to plan the reorganization of 12,000 objects. Firstly, you have to define and find storage solutions for specific and complicated objects, which are called the outliers, okay. like, um, like, like I show it again, the big dollhouses, the theater decors. And um, each team. Uh, needs to find solutions for each sector or space in relation to the type of collection which is going to be stored in that section. Here you see the yellow team who is creating a plan for a newly consulta consultation and study room, mainly due to the existence of this um, server in, in that part, in the beginning of that part of the storage, we decided to uh, create a study room with non-collection items, 
where uh, authorized people or unauthorized people like visitors, researchers, and technicians could work without entering the room hosting the collection. So we added a second door to the storage. Um, and here you have a study room with no collection items, and then starts the new storage. This drawing shows the, ga the gain of having team members with different uh, drawing skills in your team. And here you see the red team working on its proposal using red paper furniture cutouts sized to scale. The green team who is working with green cutouts. All teams present their storage reorganization plan to each other to finally achieve the overall and future plan number five of the storage. This is the reorganization plan. And on this plan, you see immediately which furniture from, for example, the red team has to be moved to another sector and vice versa. I'll show you now uh, how we shuffled all these cabinets and collection items during the last three days of the workshop. It was all about regrouping collections and furniture, of course. And first, all objects on the floor and above cabinets were moved to the yellow room. You see non-collection on top of a cabinet, moving heavy objects with a trolley, moving of a boat. Afterwards, Afterwards, all empty and non-collection cabinets were moved out of the storage. See Gael and uh, participants getting out empty cupboards, which were not uh, good to use anymore. And this is a, spa is a space outside of the storage full with non-collection items. Then. All 12 cabinets with non-collection books were moved to the study room with the help of the technical team. And we created a space for transit and for making handling supports. Here in red, see on the right side of, uh, of the all-over corridor. This is like the swing space um, Simon is talking about, but we didn't have a swing space. We made, we made a transit space uh, within the storage. Pictures of ceramics in transit, transport material, collection items in transit um, where we wrote on the tape the identification of the new location, so where we had to bring the objects to. And um, then we transferred the toy collection object per object. And these were 15 cabinets of toys which were moved into the storage room, and mainly uh, coming from this yellow room. So this is a glance of the toy collection. And here you see Linda and Alicia emptying one of the cabinets. So after three days of complete shifting, 120 cabinets and 42 shelf units were moved. 12,000 objects were transferred. Um, we worked 2,000 man hours uh, during uh, those two weeks. And only one shelf unit was bought. And this is the final plan of the folk art storage with the study room, the, enter the first entrance, the study room, the second entrance. And um, you see visitor visitors now have access to uh, the big corridor, which we decided to be the exhibition corridor. Because uh, on top of each collection section, you see the paintings, the stone and ceramics, we created exhibition cabinets. I will show you later on how it looks like in real life. It took us two days for team building and getting started. 
two and a half days for making the condition reports of the storage, two more days for planning the reorganization, and three days for implementing it. Um, here you see, here you have a view of the exhibition corridor before and after reorg. So this is the corridor before and after. It's not super attractive, but you see that due to the lighting, we could finally see something. And you see here the closed cabinets on top of the different sectors. And um, but when you open the cabinets during visits, uh, Linda can show now an, an overview of most important and attractive collection items. This is the study room before and after. Here you see heavy paintings which were which were stored on top of small cabinets and which now are stored in open boxes on wheels. The painted panels uh, of the theater decors are now stored in the one and only uh, bolt shelf unit here on your right. Tiny metal objects are stored into little drawers, small uh, little drawers. And the self-evaluation after reorg shows, shows uh, huge improvements. Uh, now, we have to look after reorg. Only key policies and procedures have to be reviewed. And the visibility of the Rio project helped the curator to obtain additional budget to buy conservation material, furniture, and equipment. So after we all left, she and her assistant started individual object conservation. They were finally able to update and complete the inventory. And the attractive storage allowed special visitors to enter and visit the storage. Only a few weeks after the reorg project, Linda invited the friends of the museum to visit the folk art storage for the first time. And this event resulted in the purchase of two of the most precious objects now enriching the collection. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marjo. That was, that was fantastic. Um, and I do want to um, highlight this aspect of community engagement and um, the, once again being able to use collections for, uh, to support the museum's activities, to support the museum's mandate. And that is actually part of the assignment for next week. So we'll be going sh very shortly into questions, but I just want to uh, go over what you all have to do for next week. Um, and one, the first thing is to complete the reorg self-evaluation for your own museum or for a museum that you work with. Um, and there is a question in the assignment that you'll be receiving. If it's not already available on the platform, it will be uploaded shortly, which is in a Word document. There's a question there about how do you plan to use your collection after you've done your reorg? So think of an innovative, creative way that you can use your collection in a way that you maybe cannot use it right now, but that you would be able to if you had um, visibility of it or if you had access to it. And so uh, we just want to get you thinking about that dimension because it's so, so important. And some, many of our participants are saying, you know, we really have um, problems communicating that to our management. That, you know, they, they, they look at this project and they initially they think, well, so you're just going to, you know, clean up, so what's the big deal? Um, they, some, some people who are maybe not familiar with the context that you're working in may not fully grasp the benefit that this kind of project can bring. So it's really important to communicate it into those terms as well. So yes, you are showing the before and after self-evaluation results, and you're showing vast improvements in you know, management, collections, furniture, and, um, and a building. But also from your stakeholders' perspective, what are you bringing that you couldn't do before? That's really key. Um, thank you so much. Um, I do have just a small question from Arjo before we go into our questions from our viewers. Is um, like like our project in Canada, um, in Belgium, you did eventually after this workshop, you had some individual museums 
who um, implemented projects, much like we did in Canada. So, and these museums were much smaller, and we're working with much, much smaller teams. And I would argue that that size of museum is probably um, similar to the museums that are listening in today. So may not have 20 people working on their project. So what would you say is the big difference between you know, that workshop experience where you had like, all these people working together uh, at the same time for a very short amount of time, and how your participants uh, working in the smaller context, smaller museum with fewer people, how is the difference between those two experiences? Um, I think if you, if you remember the slide where I showed you that uh, we reorganized the whole thing, like uh, 12,000 objects um, with 2,000 man hours of work. We were around 28, and we did that in within 20 days. Um, if you have a reorg, small reorg project or a project um, on your own, you are doing this this on your own. Um, the same amount of work or the same work we did in the big workshop, it would take for one person, it would take you around one one year of work. Uh, counting the, the the working days and, and uh, eliminating the weekends. So, of course, it takes uh, much more time when you are uh, when you are on your own or when you are in a small museum. It's the fact that you are in team and that you are full time two weeks together, and you have a big group of people who uh, who uh, who can work uh, intensively on the problem. Um, what I want to emphasize also is that uh, the fact that you are in team and, and that you can uh, that you can help each other and encourage uh, each other is uh, perhaps also one of the strongest points of a, of a workshop or a big project. And that's why I think you really need to foresee when you are doing a small reorg project or a pro or you want to start to reorganize storage in your museum. Don't do it by your own. Mm, yeah. Please don't do it by your own because it's so important to have a backup or to have uh, many people uh, seeing what you are doing. Yeah, you really need that momentum um, and that encouragement from the different team members. Yes, 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 because um, all museums who, who did a, a, a real project in Belgium they all managed to do uh, to finish in the time limits that we we asked them to do it. But the one and only who was by her own, um, she had much difficulties, and she's still working on it. We keep in touch with her. She stays into our network, but uh, it makes it all uh, much more difficult. For us, I guess the the issue is that when you do a workshop like this, you're really blocking your time, and you're not in your own institution. You're away from work, and you're able to devote all of your day to doing this. But when you get back to your own institution, you know you have meetings, you have uh, visits, you have programming, you have fundraising to do. Like there's a million things that need to be done on top of reorg. So what our participants are facing, are are, are challenged with, is is blocking off or carving out some time for this. Uh, project uh, because it's not like they're they're given extra time uh, they're taken off other projects to do this so they need to find time and and what participants have said is I really need to write that block off like the the Friday afternoon or the Friday of every week uh, so that I, I keep that for reorg only because uh, otherwise it's very hard to block off the time and for our project we said we had uh, 340 person days so if you're working a, an eight-hour day for the size that that size project, um, that's about uh, eight and a half weeks. And so what we did yes. in three days, you know, you do in eight and a half weeks. That's if if you're working full time. So it it is kind of something to consider for sure. Yes. So it it would be. I I see many people are connected now, and uh, we also have these these. Uh, this uh, Facebook page and, and a lot of social media, it's very important to stay connected to each other. And uh, I'm happy to read questions and, and replies uh, <laughs> yes. from the participants who are the people who, are, uh, who join us to listen to the webinar, because it's uh, very powerful. And um, it is uh, getting us out of, us, of uh, our isolation. Well, with that are said, we ready um, to start questions? Yeah. For sure, yes. Okay. 
Before we start, I, I just want to go over a few things. I will add the links from the webinar slides, and uh, and the I'll post the slides and the recording uh, in the handouts. The recording will be posted where it says access the recording, but the other things I will post in the handouts for each week. And <clears throat> the you need to view the webinars in order uh, in order to get to the next spot. So whether you view them live or as a recording is no problem, but you need to view them. And um, for those of you that are going to um, get the Credly badge, which is a, an electronic recognition that you did this, um, you need to listen to all the webinars and you need to complete the assignments. And so that's just the, the bare bones of it. So um, let's see. There was a question about the budget in the Canadian project, and I think you went over that. Um, do you want to have say anything else about the budget? Uh, no. I mean, I, I saw that there was a comment about uh, the museum being able to access a federal grant to implement uh, the project, and that was to cover exactly as was said in the comments to cover the cost of the storage equipment. Um, so that was, um, yes, exactly. So it was uh, $5,000 Canadian, uh, 30, I think it was 3500 US. So I'm not sure exactly the conversion, but it's a small, a small amount. Uh, and that doesn't include staff time, of course. That's just for equipment. Yeah. Yes, I, um, I, I, I yeah, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. Perhaps we didn't. Perhaps we didn't mention that the the real the method is uh, especially uh, also uh, made for for small museums who really don't have any money and who who do uh, recoup and and reuse uh, furniture, existing furniture. Simon mentioned it also, where you can find in the museum somewhere else stuff that you can use. And uh, when I launched the strategy in Belgium. I specifically asked uh, or told uh, the museums in the in the in the call for proposals that they only needed to foresee around three thousand uh, euros to um, to to join us and 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 so you see these these are very small uh, amounts. Yeah. Um, let's see. There. Are, uh, we posted a lot of uh, resources on making boxes. So, and also, if you look on the Connecting to Collections Care website or in Stash, um, there are lots of methods for making boxes. Maria Garcia Morales says, um, "Doesn't uh, pegboard expel a lot of vol volatile compounds?" Yeah. So pegboard does off gas, but. Um what we're really concerned about is pegboard being in contact with objects that are vulnerable to that off-gassing. And so, um, as you'll recall in the first uh, before uh, slides, the pegboard was in directly in contact with textiles, which are actually more vulnerable than the objects that were and en that ended up being in, a, in contact with it. So, the en the objects that were put on the pegboard were wooden objects mostly. They're canes. Um, and whenever there were textile elements to those things, like uh, I know that there's a few um, umbrellas, those were wrapped. Um, yeah, so it's really a question of is it, vul is it vulnerable? Uh, and we, we kind of tend to go with this uh, risk-based approach, which really there is a lot of best practice that says avoid all of that stuff because it off-gasses. But if it's actually not harmful to the collection and it's not Actively damaging it, or if it's you know if it's safe, then why would you not reuse it to have the collection? So that's kind of where we start from: is is there a risk? And if there isn't, then okay. Um, was the choice to hang clothing items made primarily for space considerations? Uh, that was one of the considerations. Definitely, we considered what could be hung safely based on um, a range of criteria. There's a ve actually a very good CCI note on textile storage that goes over different criteria for assessing, you know, what can be hung, what can be rolled, what can be um, boxed, and so 
we kind of went by those guidelines in, in terms of what we decided should be boxed. Some stuff that was hanging at the beginning, we did end up boxing. Um, and of course, at the end of these three days, that's not to say that everything is stored perfectly. There's still a lot of work that can be done and to improve the situation, but it would have been impossible in the, in the before situation to even think about doing things like uh, putting everything on padded hangers because there is no place to, <laughs> as, as you put things on padded hangers, it doubles the size that you need. And so there wouldn't have been any place to do that and to store it effectively. So we kind of need to go through that first physical reorganization part for them to be able to do all those detailed uh, improvements afterwards. Um, Sylvia Marina says, do you have uh, plans for very small institutions, those who only have two staff members, no col uh, collections manager, and nearly zero staff? Um, yeah. But I know Sylvia has students. OK. <laughs> yeah. Um, most of the people who are working, I mean, you saw two examples here of two workshops where we had a lot of people working at the same time for a short amount of time. Um, our project was 10 times smaller than the Belgium one in terms of uh, surface area. Uh, but a lot of our participants, well, all of our participants who are working um, and using the reorg method on their own are actually, uh, you know, have one or two staff. Uh, so sometimes it's one pers one permanent staff and volunteers, and sometimes it's just two staff. And so the REARC method is really designed to be scaled for those. And that's really what we're going to be focusing on in these webinars is institutions with, you know, a, you know, a small staff and limited resources. That's our focus. So even though you saw these two examples to start with, everything else is going to be really focused on that reality. Okay. Um. Berlin Lois says um, she's interested in archaeological collections. So this would apply to any kind of collection, yes? Yeah? yeah, we've had all kinds of uh, institutions with all kinds of collections apply, from libraries, archives, uh, art collections, uh, historical uh, community museum collections, um, you know, everything. There's no real uh, limit to what you can use it for. And in okay. Belgium, we are also uh, even have churches uh, who uh, try to rearrange their uh, their objects or the collections they have. Um, they use the method to get the uh, to get a good reorganized um, space to store all their precious objects. Um, Beate Yule asks. Uh, he says, I don't have handouts. If you look on the Elevate website, which is where you connected to the, the webinar, the handouts are there. So um, you'll find them on that website. Uh, so, and they're not below. Um, Simon, do you ever include time and other in-kind contributions in the budget? or have recommendations for museums who want to make a case for this kind of project to management uh, or their board of directors? Um, so the grants that our participants uh, accessed here and that are available in Canada, I'm not familiar with all the grants in all the countries who are participating today, but our grants are 50% um, matching funding grants. And so they uh, typically what are uh, museums are doing is they're using all the staff time that they're devoting to this project prorated um, as the in-kind cont contribution for the for the project. So um, if it's a you know seven thousand dollar total budget, half of that will come from just staff time of the of the institutions because very few of them actually have any money to put towards uh, the matching portion, and so they're all using staff time. Um, and then I think the recommendations for museums that want to make a case for uh, projects for the board of directors, I think you really need to show them what the benefit will be for them. Um, so apart from you know being able to access your collection and being able to store it properly and for it to look nice and for it to, you know, all of my inventory is complete, I think we need to move beyond that and show what the benefit's going to be for the community. And that's really where I think we need to focus now is we figured out the, the technical component of this, but now we need to really sell it from a community benefit perspective. Like, what's what's the bigger picture here? Why are we doing this? What's the point? Yeah, I'm, uh, Nancy and everyone, I will 
um, put in the. I'll send you a note from the the yes. Elevate platform so you can download things. Um, we, we've really run out of time here, but there's one really important question that Fabiola Corona says, which is, in the introduction to the self-evaluation uh, tool, it says, if you have more than one storage room, fill out one evaluation per room. How do you consolidate all your room evaluations into one final report? Uh, we don't typically do that. We tend to leave it out like by, by room, just because Doing an average of those of those scores then can skew the results towards the bigger rooms, and so I wouldn't, um, I, you know, sometimes it's like a small room that has a lot of problems with very few objects that are less valuable, let's say, but you have a large room with a lot of objects uh, that's doing fine, and then that so that can make things look better than they are. Um, and so you might want to consider just leaving it per room as you're communicating that score. What do you um, think about that? There's one other mechanical question here, and then we're going to have to stop. Uh, Lindsay Hamarustruk, probably just massacred that. Um, how would you like participants to complete the assignments if participants are on leave or between an institution? Apply the uh, assignment to their past position, um, I'd say that's probably fine. Is it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, yes. OK. Definitely. That sounds fine. So um, we will see you next week for the next webinar at the same time. And remember, you can watch the webinars live, or you can watch the recording. Um, and. Uh, this is great. Thank you very much. Thank you and all thank for you, Mike. In. Sorry, Simon. But thank you all for.